Hello. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Donor Research Network team at the University of Queensland for inviting me to participate in this symposium. I'm Dr Peter Flanagan. I've worked for New Zealand Blood Service initially as the Medical Director and more recently as the Transfusion Medicine Specialist for over 20 years. I'm also the current chairperson of the Standing Committee of Ethics of the International Society of Blood Transfusion and in that role have completed a review of the Society's Code of Ethics and that role has very much introduced me to uh, the area of ethics and transfusion medicine. These are my disclosures. The presentation is going to focus on whole blood and component donation in the context of the voluntary sector. Apheresis plasma destined solely for fractionation, particularly when collected in a commercial environment, is a much more complex issue, and I'm not going to be addressing that today. The presentation will initially focus on the principle of voluntary non-remunerated donation and the allied ethical principles of altruism, social solidarity and beneficence. I'll then briefly introduce the Nuffield Council of Bioethics Intervention Ladder, followed by a review of the published evidence on reward and recognition strategies. And finally, I'll end with some conclusions and recommendations for national blood services working in this area. Blood services exist to provide sufficient, safe blood and blood products to the hospitals that they serve to support patients. If we are to achieve this, we need to ensure we have sufficient, healthy and safe donors available. We also know that people's lives are becoming increasingly busy and therefore that the time they have available for acts of public good, such as blood donation, are therefore limited. And at the same time, we're increasingly competing with other social good organisations for the time of volunteers. And because of that, we need to develop recognition and reward strategies for donors to ensure that we're able to meet our goals on a regular basis. In 1975, the World Health Assembly endorsed Resolution 2872 on the utilisation and supply of human blood and blood products. This resolution identifies the increased risks of paid as opposed to voluntary non-remunerated donation for both donors and recipients and goes on to urge member states to develop national blood services based on BNRD and to enact legislation and to take other actions to promote the health of donors and the recipients of blood and blood products. In 1997, the Council of Europe endorsed the Oviedo Convention. This Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and the Dignity of the Human Being with regard to application of biology and medicine underpins, is underpinned by the principle that the human body and its parts shall not as such give rise to financial gain. The Convention identifies the key drivers to voluntary non-remunerated donation, the avoidance of exploitation and commercialisation of the human body and the consequent safety of blood and blood components, respect for the autonomy and the integrity of the human being and the principles of altruism, beneficence and social solidarity. It also identifies the necessity of assuring adequate supply to meet the needs of patients. Now, the concept of social solidarity was initially described by Emile Durkheim 
and refers to a set of values that bind a certain social group together with the belief that everyone is in one accord. Durkheim believed that social solidarity is the normal condition of society and that given the opportunity, individuals within that society will take actions to support each other. Auguste Comte initially introduced the concept of altruism. He defined this as living for the sake of others, identifying a belief in or practice of disinterested and selfless concern for the well-being of others. Beneficence is action that is done for the benefit of others. Such actions can be taken to help prevent or remove harms or simply to improve the situation of others. The key difference between altruism and beneficence is that beneficence can result in some benefit to the individual undertaking the act, whereas strictly altruism should not. There are two acknowledged definitions of voluntary non-remunerated donation shown here on this slide. The first is from the Council of Europe and the second from the US Food and Drug Administration. The two definitions are essentially the same. The only difference is the way that the information and requirements is presented. In 2014, the Nuffield Council on Bioethics published the report of its investigation on ethical issues relating to the human body and its donation for use in medicine and research. The investigation included an analysis of the systems used for donating blood in the UK and the role that altruism should play in it. In doing so, they defined a ladder for evaluating interventions used for recognition, reward and incentivization of donation. The ladder comprises six rungs. The first four are considered to be entirely consistent with the principle of voluntary non-remunerated donation. Actions that will not result in real benefit to the individual performing the act. Actions five and six are more complex and will result in benefit either in kind or a financial incentive to the donor. These may then lead to a change in the underpinning reason that an individual decides to donate and makes the situation more difficult. Uh, the Nuffield Council identifies that this ladder distinguishes between actions that are ethically straightforward to those that are ethically more complex. I think most importantly, they also identify that payment per se does not necessarily, in all instances, remove the altruistic drive for donation. It simply will require a more considered analysis as to whether the requirements of BNRD are being met. This study aimed to understand the behavior that results in individuals donating and returning to donate again, and concluded that empirical evidence exists to suggest that blood donation is not, in fact, predicted by pure altruistic motives, more by a specific pattern of motives that they call benevolence, whereby both donor and recipient benefit from the act of donation, with the donor gaining a so-called emotional warm glow. They go on to conclude that emphasising the warm glow may be helpful with respect to recruiting and maintaining donors. And identify that we need to understand what motivates people to donate 
in order to determine which interventions will be most effective. These two studies, now from 2007 and 2008, investigated what factors determined whether an individual would return to donate or lapsed. And the findings of the two studies were very similar. In the first study, donors who lapsed reported a lower level of satisfaction with their last donation experience, suggesting that this is a strong determinant of return behaviour. And the authors concluded that transfusion agencies should therefore pay close attention to the quality of service offered to their donors. The second study identified that blood donor satisfaction varies among demographics and donation history subgroups and is positively correlated with the intent to return for future donation. This study from 2021 during the COVID-19 pandemic in Germany investigated the relationship ship between donor motives, donation experience and the intention to return. 56% of the participating donors wanted to contribute to the fight against the pandemic. This is social cohesion in action, people taking action to help others within their society. Donor satisfaction with the last donation was high and the vast majority of donors felt very safe. However, those donors who felt unsafe expressed a low intention to return and blood donation services should therefore carefully monitor donor satisfaction. If we take these studies I've recently identified together, we can conclude, I think, that the first thing that blood services need to do to ensure that donors will return is to get the basics right. We need to ensure that we have good facilities in the right location for donors with good parking. We need to have opening hours that will work for the donors. And most importantly, we need to give good levels of customer service and donor care. We need to introduce information and recognition systems to reinforce the so-called warm glow effect. And we need to develop systems to remind donors about their appointments. And this may require us to tailor solutions to target demographic groups. These two studies, again, focus on possible strategies to increase the likelihood that voluntary non-remunerated donation donors will donate more frequently. And the conclusions of the two analyses are shown here. The first publication identifies that when considering the question, how can we make our donors donate more frequently, the extant empirical literature provides very few definitive answers. The second, identifies an increasing need for large-scale randomised controlled field trials to systematically evaluate interventions designed on the basis of psychological re research. They acknowledge that such trials provide substantial challenges, but argue that the promise of psychology in providing the who and the how to successfully recruit donor pa panel members efficiently is indeed great. Essentially, we need better information on which interventions actually work. This 2018 study from Australia undertook a systematic review of publications related to incentives in blood donation. And the key conclusions are identified here. Firstly, they identify that no incentive has yet been identified that all segments of both the non-donor and donor panel report positive attitudes towards, that also has a positive impact on behaviour 
and no negative impact on blood safety. They identify that certain incentives, discounts, tickets, gifts, have the strongest evidence base for potential inclusion within a VNRD donation system. They also identify that the extant literature suggests that the offering of these types of incentives is likely to be disproportionately favoured and responded to by young and or first time donors and will be more successful in retaining new and infrequent donors. The review identifies that donors in paid contexts generally have more positive attitudes towards incentives than do non-donors. And in turn, non-donors have more positive attitudes than do donors within an unpaid context. Cash incentives are generally reviewed negatively by donors, except by some in paid contexts. But there is some indication that donors will view health checks and low monetary value gifts such as movie or raffle tickets positively and that this may help improve donation frequency. Again, from Australia, a systematic review and meta-analysis of the literature, looking at 28 trials in 25 published articles, identified that the best performing interventions to improve return rate were letters and telephone calls or telephone call only with odds ratio of three and two as identified on the slide. The authors found no evidence that monetary incentives were effective at increasing donations compared to current practice. They also identified that non-monetary incentives were only effective in the donor subgroup, reinforcing the difference between individuals who do donate and those that don't. Overall, they concluded that when pooling across modes of intervention, the effectiveness of incentives remains unclear with limited and disparate evidence found. This next study involved a series of in-depth interviews with donors exploring attitudes to non-monetary incentives currently used or under consideration by the Australian Red Cross Blood Service. And the key findings are identified here. The study found that the only form of incentive that was seen to crowd out altruistic motivations to donate were monetary incentives, and that many donors saw this as a negative believing that it devalued the act of donation. It found that incentives that facilitate the effort expended in donations were received positively by the donors. These included post-donation refreshments and paid time off work to donate. Interestingly, it also identified that blood donors identify with the goals of the blood service and think and behave in ways that maximise the benefit to it. Some donors are therefore concerned about the costs of incentives, whilst others consider the potential benefit in promoting the blood service more widely. It also found that incentives that signify and support a donor's competence were more important than those that try to control a donor's behaviour. And I think interestingly, that donors prefer private acknowledgement as better than public recognition. Again, perhaps reinforcing this warm glow. They conclude overall that when operating in a voluntary non-remunerated environment, Blood services should view donors as supply partners rather than customers. That we should only consider non-monetary incentives that are congruent with the act of donation and provide private rather than public recognition of key donation milestones. So when we decide to establish 
a reward and recognition for program program for donors. The first thing that we have to do is ensure that we have a clear goal and a clear as to which donor group we are targeting. Is it first time or regular donors? Is it whole blood or apheresis donors? One thing that the literature does identify is that different strategies may be required for each of these groups. It also suggests that we need to develop reward programmes in dialogue with the donors and that there is no one solution that will work for all and therefore that we need to monitor the impact of interventions and review as needed. A number of studies have been undertaken to see what might influence the decision to donate. And in this study from 2006, almost 8,000 donors who had donated in the previous year were asked to complete a self-administered questionnaire that asked them to rate the importance of 17 factors in their last donation decision. More than 90% of each group cited the desire, responsibility or perceived duty to help others as important or very important. This again, the principle of social cohesion. They identified that being asked to donate at work was an important motivator. And some, though by no means all, identified that getting the results of a health screen appealed to many. And interestingly, this appeared to be more important to some ethnicities of donors than it was to others. This study aimed to assess the uh, how, how the extent to which provision of free cholesterol testing for donors might act as a motivation device. And there were two studies, one looking at non-donors, the other at donors, and three interventions in each of them. The first was the donor receiving a solicitation letter, the second a letter with an appeal, and the third both the letter appeal and provision of a free cholesterol test. For non-donors, only 0.6% responded to the solicit solicitation letter and there was no significant difference between the three interventions. In study two, focusing on donors, 45% of the donors returned to donate. The appeal appeared, uh, appeared to result in a marginal increase in response compared to the standard invite. But interestingly, the cholesterol test did not significantly increase donation rate compared to the standard letter. So overall, the authors concluded that cholesterol testing did not significantly increase donations in either of the two groups. Perhaps more importantly, they concluded that these studies demonstrate that field experiments are an important method to evaluate donor incentives because measuring intentions alone might lead to significantly different conclusions. This study evaluated the response of first time donors to three incentives. Donors might be provided with a t-shirt, might be provided with a recruitment script incorporating a patient story or a complimentary message with the donor blood group. The third was a telephone versus email recruitment. The primary outcome of the study was that the individual gave a second donation within six months and just over one in five of the donors returned. Provision of a t-shirt was not effective in increasing the return rate. Script A, the patient story, was more effective than script B. Email was substantially less effective than a telephone call, again suggesting that a direct relationship with the donor and the blood service is seen to be important. The authors concluded that you can use randomized con control studies to evaluate donor incentives 
and again reinforce the principle that physical incentives are not always seen as being effective. The Nuffield Council in their report looked at the types of payment for donation and identified that there were three different types of payment that could be identified. The first was recompense, when essentially the payment involves recognition of losses that the donor has incurred. The second and third were reward and purchase. With these two, the donor physically benefited from the payment process. Um, and these might be considered not to be consistent with the principle of non-remunerated donation. When considering the difference between recompense, which is consistent with the NRD, and reward, which likely is not, there are two questions we need to consider. The first is, does the intervention result in the donor being better off than there would have been had they not donated? The second is, does the intervention change the motivation to donate? i.e. does the incentive become more important than the underlying desire to donate? If the answer to either of those questions is yes, then the donor is being rewarded for their donation and it is then possible that the act of donation is not driven by an altruistic intent but by something else. This would then contravene the principle of VNRD. We can use this approach when we look at reimbursement of direct financial expenses for donors. If we, if we reimburse parking costs, either based on the provision of receipts or by validation of a parking ticket, then that doesn't result in the donor being better off. It's a form of recompense and is entirely compatible with the Council of Europe definition of voluntary non-remunerated donation. If, however, we start to provide a fixed sum to donors on request to cover parking costs with no receipt or ticket, or provide a fixed sum of money to all donors to cover possible parking and petrol costs, inevitably an increasing proportion of donors will be materially better off as a consequence of the intervention. This might be seen as a reward for donation and is therefore more, co more ethically complex and potentially inappropriate. Blood services need to consider the likely effectiveness of an intervention, the likelihood that will it will impact adversely on the motivation to donate, and at the same time, consider the operational ease of implementation. And working through this may not be easy. So, to conclude, blood services increasingly need to find ways to motivate, motivate donors to donate more frequently. And this is increasingly seen in the case of collection of apheresis platelets and plasma, which requires more time. Efforts should be made to ensuring that unnecessary barriers to donation are removed. We need convenient locations and we need high levels of clinical and customer service. The available evidence, though limited, indicates that most voluntary non-remunerated donors are motivated by altruism or benevolence. Understanding the motivation to donate is an important step in improving the frequency of donation. The primary goal of an incentive program should be to, to add an extra prompt or encouragement for those already disposed to donate for altruistic reasons, whilst avoiding individuals not inclined to donate to do so. The available evidence on the effectiveness of incentives to achieve this is limited and the results somewhat variable. Monetary incentives do not appear 
to be important for the VNRD donor population and might act as a disincentive for some donors. The impact of non-monetary incentives varies by age, by donor status and possibly donor experience. There is no one size fits all solution to achieving the overall goal of improving donation frequency. And therefore we need when developing reward and recognition strategies to tailor these to the various groups within the overall population of donors. I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, by all means, email me. My email address is shown here. Thank you and goodbye.